Knock, knock from that hot spot. I don't know why I'm rhyming. I'm in all black. When the lights out, you can still see that I'm shining. I can't believe you made me come here. Since I'm here, just to clear, just more smoke to the open air. For the fire, it's so clear to pay homage. I said pay homage. This is ruthless, like a family of five and ain't ruthless. So my, my mind, I feel the cool quick, like a G5 with no stupidness. For the Jimmy guy, but this music makes me feel like a god, that's the truth. I just laughed at the fact that's stupid, like being cross-eyed and toothless. But the dot your eyes and cross your teeth if you talk to me. But I don't talk that much, so just step aside. The rap game been bugged, don't pesticide. You better use this. If you catch your high, you just use it. I'm not new to this, but it's my time. New boots, new boots. Been to my grind, take care of my new crew. What you know about me? I'm the next best thing. Brain food, brain food, brain food. And if you ever around me, I don't shoot a code, nothing I do. Pay homage. Peace, power, and love. What's going on? It's your one and only Kansu Sheshmoor Moon right here with Team Osiris. And yes, we are live again. Once again, man, we are live. And we have another dynamic topic tonight, man. If you missed us yesterday, we talked about the um, understanding of how to critically use and assimilate the Bible. Um, of course, with the Bible, being the most published book in the world, the most popular book in the world, going across many different genres and culture, cultural um, um, ethnic groups. Um, the Bible is often misunderstood and it's interpreted in so many different ways. And it has created so many different arguments on so many different abstract levels. Is it true? Is it not? Things like that. And one thing about being intellectual, meaning using your intelligence, i.e. your mind, is the power and the ability of self-discernment, the ability to be self-understanding, self-sufficient, um, self-aware. Um, a catchphrase that has been used in a, a kind of a pop culture community, which is called the conscious community, is consciousness. And when you add ethnic overtones to it, it's really called the Black Conscious Movement. And you have pragmatic figures that engage in lively conversation, mostly debate, and it, it, it sparks thought. So in these thoughts, sometimes we have to understand that there's actually a procedure and a process to critical thinking and even um, critical reading. And there are going to be some elements that um, you know, we want to bring out tonight in speaking on critical thinking and critical reading. These are important skills that are needed when dealing in um, even religious books, spiritual books, and primarily academia, because um, we don't hold ourselves to rigorous standards when we read a publication. A lot of times we tend to escape in the publications that we're reading just out of pure um, uh, affinity. And that does not mean, uh, could you mute your phone, could you mute the background please? That, that, that does not leave uh, uh, much room for uh, objectivity because it depends on what you're allowing yourself to be subject to. So before I start, actually I have a presentation and I want to um, give some definitive terms and things of that nature. Let's introduce the panel. From my left to your right is Brother Heru. What's going on, bro? What's the word, family? What's going on? Peace, everybody. Peace to the panel. Peace to the viewers. What's going on? Man, all is well, bro. All is good, man. We're going to try to get it in tonight. You know, we're putting in uh, heavy work, man. We see a void in the community, and we see it's going to be that way for a little while, so we got to come help our people out, man. Our brother Chris, what's going on? Uh, peace, Brother Kansu. Uh, peace, uh, Brother um, Heru. Peace, Mel. Peace, Brother Meech. Uh, Team Osiris on the horizon. Um, like Brother Kansu said, you know, there's a, there's a hole, there's a void in the, um, in the community. I'm not even going to say the conscious community. I'm going to say the community as a whole um, and all of, all of our diversities in general. There's a, there's a hole 
and we're here to fill that hole and hopefully we can lead um, the community in the right direction. So uh, Team Osiris on the horizon, peace. And uh, Brother Melvin, man, how goes it? What's going on, King? It's good, man. Peace to the team. Uh, peace to the other brothers on the panel today. Uh, definitely, uh, Team Osiris is on the horizon. Peace to the listeners. Uh, thank you for rocking with us. Uh, be prepared to take some notes. I know I will. And uh, join in. Last but not least, man, Brother Menace, man. What's the word, bro? I be out there in the D. Peace. Peace to the, the panel rising. Kim check Kim. You're breaking up really bad. No, I'm the critically think and decide. You're breaking up really bad. I don't know if anyone else actually heard him. But no, he was real bad. Yeah, you you was uh you was muffled real bad, bro. You have to repeat what you said. Hey, I hear me now. Much better, bro. Okay, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, peace to the panel. Peace to my family. Uh, Team Osiris is definitely on the horizon. Um, I want to shout out D-Boy Syndicate. You make the moves in Detroit. You know what I'm saying? Midwest up. And uh, I think I think the audience will be. Uh, uh, I think the audience is in for a special treat today. You know what I'm saying? To learn how to or to uh, get some kind of direction in a way of critical thinking. Because that is needed with everything in life. So um, I hope they enjoy it and uh, I'm going to All right, bro. And so it, it, it's, it's really vital. We've done, we've done a presentation like this before. We've talked about critical uh, thinking, um, mostly critical writing, and we would do it in a separate presentation expounding on critical thinking. But what I thought about doing is revising it and kind of bringing the two elements together because critical thinking, we go into what we, we say is a pedagogy, pedagogy of psychological education and understanding the school of thinking, um, psychiatry and psychology. And it is very important on how you process data. How you process that is very important. Um, a lot of times we take information for face value without giving critical analysis of what it is. And a lot of times we find ourselves um, unknowingly being biased. And being biased is not always a bad thing. You can't help what you're being subject to, but being biased is a definite problem in our being scholarly. Um, and so we want to try to disparage the acts of being biased, even though a lot of us, we are. A lot of times, like I have an affinity for George G.M. James, Stolen Legacy, one of my favorite books. Um, but as time passed and some of the technology that Brother James didn't have back then gave way to greater insight, I had to be more critically um, uh observant of that book that was my favorite because it's still some things that hold form there but i found some things that became uh shaky so i had to be honest to myself about the situation and we have to treat all works um uh literal works literary works i'm sorry not literal but literary works with the same um criticism so what i want to do is i want to kind of show i want to start with um an outline of how um, I'm going to kind of present everything today, give everybody an overview. And we want to try to deal with things, what I would, what I would coin, it's a common term, uh, empirical. So we want to try to coin things that are empirical so that you 
yourself can be critical in my assessment to give you the ability to criticize me and need to be critical of myself even when I'm presenting. So this is to keep everything, to keep a flow. Um, this is an outline. The format in this particular outline is a Harvard format. For those of you who, are, who also present or aspire to do what we do here at Team Osiris, it's, in Harvard, it's a Harvard outline, and this is to help you stay on track. You can even use a Harvard outline when you're thinking about writing a book, a project, anything. Outlines really help you keep things in focus. Um, and this gives you an understanding of what the objective is in the presentation. But this is about being critical, thinking and reading. So we're going to go into critical thinking, um, which is going, we're going to go into the etymology of critical thinking, the definitions, some of the terms that are synonymous with critical thinking, um, the logic and rationality with the subtopics of inductive versus deductive thinking. A lot of times you hear me talk about reasoning. Well, let's get into the thinking process of being inductive and deductive. And then let's go into critical thinking and rationality. That's very important of being rational and a critical thinker. Um, let's go into the functions of critical thinking and reading, the procedure of critical thinking, and the habits and the traits of the mind in regards or juxtaposed to critical thinking. And then we're going to go into critical reading which is kind of straightforward, but it, it's short, but it's very powerful. And it talks about facts versus interpretation. This particular situation here gives way to a lot of arguments. A lot of times with critical reading and uh, the lack of, as, and apparently the lack of critical thinking, you find a lot of logical fallacies that, fallacies that tend to arise. And of course, what a text uh, says, what it does and what it means. So we're going to reach for the interpretation and understanding of these when we're talking about critical reading. And a lot of this is, you know, my own uh, research from researching other independent researchers. Uh, for those who ask upon requests, when you like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Team Osiris or Team Osiris Rises, come on, reach out to our website at www.teamosiris.com. You can also reach us at Team Osiris on Facebook and Team All Set which is the sisterhood and a great, great um, sister queen, uh, Nefrika, that deals in the subjects of sisterhood. You can actually request a source list so that you can go and look at some of the publications that were used in matriculating this information. So I kind of want to... Brother Kansu, um, real quick, I uh, forgot, uh, Timo Cyrus International can also be found on Facebook. Team Osiris International, Team Osiris TV, that is actually coming soon. Team Osiris International is an international interface that deals with the observation of, of America and the black paradigm from an international Uh, we apologize um, to the audience. I believe uh, Kansu dropped out. He'll be right back. Um, and uh, thank you all for uh, being with us and appreciating what we do. Yeah, he was, uh, was just explaining uh, Team Osiris International. Uh, what Team Osiris International is, it's a place, uh, or should I say it's a group uh, for other Africans of the diaspora, wherever they may be, and, uh, share topics and actually get into certain things that uh, – can help the diaspora bring certain things to life. So we thought this was a great venture to go ahead and get the whole entire African diaspora in on it. So, you know, it's, it's not coming from an African-American perspective, but it's actually coming from an international perspective of uh, Africans all across the globe. So, uh, yeah, he was just explaining that. The reason it came about because we do have uh, continental um, Africans that are on the team. And they have a totally different perspective than us uh, in the States. So we thought that um, our audience would love to um, get a, a straightforward perspective from continental Africans and those that are uh, outside of the, of the Americana uh, perspective. So, uh, so stay tuned for 
uh, the international uh, version of Team Osiris because it will give you a whole different view uh, of uh, Africans and the diaspora. I hope y'all do enjoy that new paradigm that we have uh, that we bring in Taurus for y'all. Definitely. Also, make sure to uh, like, share, and subscribe. That kind of helps us out. Uh, and you know, definitely, if you if you miss a couple of shows, uh, YouTube has a bell uh, notification. You just click that bell right beside the subscribe button by our name, and you'll be able to get those reminders. No problem. And if you haven't already uh, um, uh, followed us on Facebook, uh, go to Team Osiris uh, Facebook group. Uh, we share a lot of content, a lot of scientific content. Um, it can be beneficial to your life, uh, definitely, because uh, we say a lot of health stuff um, and a lot of genetic uh, research that we uh, all uh, collectively put in uh, work on the, on the site. So uh, definitely, and also um, uh, TeamOsiris.com. Uh, you should go there too as well. Um, if you have Google+, Plus. Um, follow us on Google Plus uh, so you can have um, access to all of our information that we're bringing forth. Yep. Then we gotta make sure we gotta make sure since we plug and we gotta plug the we gotta plug that American project coming up real soon, man. We doing uh something for for the uh, Native Americans. We doing it from that perspective, uh, telling their story. There's no questions about who these people are. Um, that's going to be real big. And we lab working on that real hard. So just be on the lookout for that when it, when it finally does drop. You know, let me uh, say this too uh, while we're waiting. Um, <clears throat> we got a lot coming up for uh, 2017. Um, I, uh, Chris, um, personally, um, working on a lecture dealing with um, certain esoteric theories and philosophies and techniques and to show the origins of a lot of these things to give the audience um, and a lot of people that don't know any better of where a lot of these new age um, things are coming from and the origins of it. So we can put it in our its proper perspective as Africans and then we can say, okay, you know, hey, we could probably use this, maybe not this and keep it moving. And that's coming up very soon. Welcome back, Brother Consul. I don't know if he can hear us. He might be trying to get something straightened up. Um, hopefully, everything's situated. Until it gets situated, uh, so, uh, um, you're, you're, um, uh, you're, we had to. You're breaking up bad, Meech. Yeah, you're breaking up real bad. Yeah, okay. I hope y'all can hear me now. Yeah, um, also, uh, my parent group uh, is uh, Black Bottom Syndicate. Uh, you can follow our content, the uh, uh, Propaganda Machine. Uh, we we uh, try to do uh, pro positive propaganda for, uh, for Black people since uh, there's so much negative propaganda put up against us uh but we have a lot of enjoyable content you can uh follow us on uh on instagram uh d boy syndicate instagram uh also the same thing on uh facebook and twitter okay so i'm sure everybody can see yeah you're good uh, to go all right yeah <laughs> we good so we're going to be talking about being critical everybody and being critical in regards to critical thinking and critical reading very, very important skills to have um, to help you understand not only what you're reading, not only how you're thinking, but to be more in tune with yourself when being rational, when you're observational. Now, we went over the objectives, and I kind of spoke to these things earlier. So, And what I'll probably do, I was going to delete the first part of the show, but I'll leave the first 12 minutes, 20 minutes up because I kind of spoke to this stuff. Okay, one of the most important objectives, though, that I put up here 
is critical reading is not simply, look at the bottom of your screen, critical reading is not simply close and careful reading. People think that's what that means. To read critically, one must actively recognize and analyze evidence upon the page. That is the most important thing. And this critical reading and thinking is an advanced form of learning, okay? It's highly advanced. Um, and so some of you that are being subject to this, take notes. Everybody, take notes because a critical individual always does. Note-taking is, is very important in critical thinking. So please do that. Um, um, and we, and um, it'll make your life that much easier. One thing about critical thinking is you get evidence through reality, dealing with the real aspects of the world. Context skills, so that you can isolate the problem from the context. I kind of talked about that in the Bible seminary series when I was talking about the Bible and understanding to read the Bible in its contextual form to get into the quantum aspects that are called verses. Because if the verses are not incognate with the context, then that means that the verses are not being interpreted properly. If they're not being interpreted properly, then there could be some bias there. Or music. Relevant criteria for making the judgment well. Okay? Is the criteria relevant to the overall context? Applicable methods or techniques for forming the judgment. Does it apply? Does the methodology apply for formulating that judgment? If I'm talking about human biology, I cannot be using human archaeology. Because even though archaeology is the umbrella, biology is a specific aspect within that. When we're talking about human biology as opposed to human archaeology. And that's just an, a working example. Applicable theoretical constructs for understanding the problem and the question at hand. Because you must recognize the evidence, realize its evidence, and then use applicable theoretical constructs. Theories that would only be applicable, which is reasonable and rational, to their questions that are posed in your mind as you read and notate. So what is critical thinking? Well, Critical thinking is also referred to as critical analysis. So it's rational thinking involving critique, and it details vary amongst those who define it. So we sum that up to say critical thinking means clear, reasoned judgments. And while you're, or during the process of critical thinking, ideas should be reasoned, well thought out, and judged. Okay, so critical thinking is very, very important. Very, very important to you being able to effectively speak to the crowd or people you're speaking to, or even speaking to yourself. It helps fortify your rhetoric when you are speaking. Etymology of critical thinking, or the term critical. When the term critical thinking, the word critical in the Greek, kritikos, equals critic. And that derives from the word critic and implies a critique. It identifies the intellectual capacity and the means of judging, of judgment or for judging and being able to discern. So here are some definitive terms, not necessarily direct def definitions, but some traditional um, critical thinking that has been variously defined by certain, um, various scholars. One is the process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing applying, analyzing, and synthesizing, and evaluating information to reach an answer or conclusion. Now, two things, two words I want you to pay attention, two terms, conceptualizing and synthesizing can be com confused with musing, okay? That means that you're making it, you're making assumptions and giving them theoretical fact because you are maintaining your critical understanding of something. So you synthesize or conceptualize. In academia, that is, you are giving a title to do that. Anyone can't just do that. That is called a doctorate of philosophy, or a philosopher will conceptualize or synthesize. But in the, to the layman, it may seem, well, you're just making that up, so that's pseudo. 
No. It's a process to conceptualizing and synthesizing by means of inductive and deductive thinking along with inductive and deductive reasoning. So the layman, because they just think the term pseudo is a blanket term, is going to think pseudo. Like people will argue that metaphysics is pseudo, that astrology is pseudo. No, it's not. If you know the methodology of it, it is not. Because there is a methodology that is scientifically used to understand conceptualizing and synthesizing. In the medieval times, they would refer to the trivium and the quadrivium, primarily the trivium, which is grammar, rhetoric, and logic, and not necessarily in that order. Discipline thinking, that is clear. This is key. Discipline thinking, that's what I mean by proper procedure and proper methodology time and time again. You do not allow your thinking to be wild and rambunctious. This is the reason of how I'm presenting this presentation. I'm giving you bullet points. I'm giving you an objective. I'm giving you an outline because it has to be methodical and in an order so that it's concise and clear. And also that I do not deviate from the objective. Okay? So it's disciplined thinking that is clear, rational, open-minded, and informed by evidence. Okay? Reasonable, reflective thinking focused on deciding what to believe or do. But it has to be reasonable and reflective, meaning you have to judge yourself before you just say what is and what isn't. Are you being fair? Are you being objective? Purposeful. Self-regulatory. Remember when I talked about being self-governing? Well, this is an adage that Herodotus had met coined when he saw these things that were synonymous in Kemet, which was the jargon, know thyself, which the Gnosis or the Gnostics used as a banner in giving the archetype of Christian Protestant religion. The Gnostics dealt in self actuating to religion or God in Christ, the body of Christ, all right? So, and that's just an example. But that results in interpretation, analysis, evaluation, and inference, as well as explanation of the event, um, evidential, conceptual, and methodical, criteriological, contextual considerations upon which a judgment is based, okay? Um, panel, did you want to, um, did you want to have anything you wanted to, um, inflict on those because that that that's some really heavy stuff right there yeah may i add something brother Constant? yeah go ahead um and this applies to uh critical thinking um i um, i remember like um in my past um i would buy tons and tons of books on <clears throat> different subjects ranging from science psychology to philosophy and whatnot and not knowing how to, number one, to critically read, and not knowing how to critically think, and not only that, but to critically understand what I'm reading and thinking about, I was kind of scattered and all over the place. But once you're able to grasp, grasp these concepts and to follow through them when you are studying and doing research, it does make all the difference. And, in, and not only that factor, um, a lot of times it will – it may carry you away from something that you thought to be true and may lead you into um, a more correct direction. That's the best way that I can say at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well said, well observed. Even with critical thinking and critical reasoning, what it does is eliminates the personal actions in debate. A lot of people will tend to um, become uh, less critical the more they read and study a thing because it starts to resonate in their own personal opinions. So this includes a, com um, a commitment to using reason in the formulation of our beliefs, if you look at the top definition. And in critical social theory, it is the commitment to the social and political practice of participatory democracy. And what that means is the willingness to imagine or to remain open to considering alternative perspectives. If you already say, look, ain't no way in the world, this is it, bottom line, that's it, that is not being critical. Even if you do have facts 
always have an open mind to be reflective and understand a person's perspective. You can't just say, you know what, that's stupid, that's dumb, that's not possible. Well, that's not being critical. That's being biased. And it shuts down your ability to use your mind capacity. It really does. And of course, this has been sitting in the screen, it's been up for a while, you see the other definitive points. So we go into logic and rationality. The ability to reason logically is a fundamental skill of rational agents. Hence the study of the form of correct argumentation. There's a right way to argue, which is relevant to the study of critical thinking. Now, it's a term called first wave that when I took critical thinking as a class, first and second wave, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna describe these things. And it was made possible by a gentleman by the name of Kerry Walter. He had a publication in 2011 that dealt with, and he really kind of revolutionized the understanding of critical thinking, okay? And one of, the, one of the biggest things is when we start getting into genetic fallacies, true Scotsman's fallacies, these kind of things, because we really don't get into the proper way to argue, the study of critical, when we get into critical thinking. Um, first wave logical thinking really has consisted of understanding the connections between two concepts or points in thought. It, it followed a philosophy, okay, where the thinker was removed from the train of actual thought. And the connections and the analysis um, of the connect was devoid of any bias of the thinker. Now, Kerry Walter, he describes this ideology in um, her essay is Beyond Logicism and Critical Thinking, okay? And a, a logistic approach to critical thinking conveys the message to students that thinking is legitimate only when it conforms to the procedures of informal and to a lesser extent formal logic. And the good thinker necessarily aims for styles of examination. And so we start getting into analytical things. We, we appraise analytical things, abstract, universal, and objective. We put them in those categories, okay? And then we keep ourselves void of actually thinking about thinking, and I know that sounds crazy, but you're a void of thinking against what is in front of you because you're observing in someone else's thoughts. Okay, guys, we're going to try to do this again, and we were t I was going into the functionality, the functions of critical thinking. Um, we kind of broke down a lot of the other facets and components of uh, critical thinking. Um, well, the, 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 the list, there's usually a list that teachers and practitioners of critical thinking um, include. And that is, it's a list of skills. And that's observation, interpretation, analysis, inference, evaluation, explanation, and metacognition. And a good, a good source is Martin Reynolds. He also wrote a great publication in 2011. Um, and it's called Critical Thinking and, uh, and Systems Thinking, Towards Critical Literacy for Systems Thinking and Practice. And in this book, what he said was, can everybody hear me? Can you still see me, guys? Yes, sir. I don't, I don't know if he was under attack. You know. So um, what he talked about was evidence through reality. Remember, we talked about that earlier. Context skills to isolate the problem from context. And I'm because I'm reiterating this because I want you to understand how important this is in thinking. Relevant criteria for making the judgment well, and applicable methods or techniques for forming the judgment, along with applicable theoretical constructs for understanding the problem and the question at hand. Okay, now these are very, very important. And these skills you need to practice observation, interpretation, analysis and inference, along with evaluation, explanation, and metacognition. Very, very important, man. Look up these words, get the definitive terms for them, and start practicing each of these skills. Very important. So we get to the habits and traits of mind, your intelligence, your intellect. Well, the habits of mind is, is what categorizes a person strongly disposed toward critical thinking. And it includes a desire to follow reason and evidence. 
wherever it goes. You're, fo- you're going to follow reason and evidence even when you're upset. I have learned this, and I'm telling you, it makes reading so much fun. Imagine teaching your children critical thinking. They will enjoy reading because it's about discovery. It's self-discovery and being observant and observant only of what you read. Stop thinking about memorizing it. Stop thinking about thinking. (laughs) Observe the data and look at it from that person's perspective. Don't put yourself in the path of caring yet until you know that you can reason and you have proper evidence. You know what that does, everybody? That means that you could take the same book and, and read it over and over again and always get new information out of it. That's what makes you exceptional when it comes to taking in information and being an actual academic scholar and learner, a true top student. You know, those A students, it's because they don't read with mind. They look at the habits and traits of the mind of the writer. So you take a systematic approach to problem solving, inquisitiveness, even handedness, and confidence in reasoning. So according to a definition analysis by Conf and Bond in 2001, critical thinking involves problem solving, decision making, and metacognition. So what I spoke of is relative to Conf and Bond. 2001, if you Google that, you'll find it, okay? So let's get into critical reading. We talked about critical thinking. And you see how vast that subject matter is because critical thinking gives you the ability to detach emotionally from the content, which means that the content never gets born because you're reading for discovery and you're reading for relative rational discovery with proper reasoning and evidence, okay? So now let's be critical of reading. And I guarantee those of us who, especially us on Team Osiris, we see it all the time. Um, And you're going to experience this too, non-critical readers. So to non-critical readers, text, you know what they do? They provide facts. What that means is readers, they gain knowledge by memorizing the statements within the text. Remember I just told you don't worry about remembering stuff yet? Get an intimate understanding of the subject matter and watch how it flows. Watch how it increases your rhetoric because you actually know what the hell you're talking about. You're actually, the brain is actually going to assimilate and start to remember and keep it in your subconscious because now you know it and the confidence comes about. And now that you have the confidence of knowing something, you can easily become abstract. And you start to matriculate things as you synthesize things from just your, your, your knowledge. This is what a PhD does. So readers gain knowledge by memorizing the statements within the text applies to a non-critical reader. But a critical reader, to that critical reader, any single text provides but one portrayal of the facts. Only one act of the facts. One individual's take, quote unquote, on the subject matter. So critical readers thus recognize not only what a text says, but also how the text portrays the subject matter. So they recognize the various ways in which each and every text is a unique creation of a unique author. So each book that you read, everybody, is only a unique creation. And to make matters worse, it's the creation of a unique author. It isn't the end all be all. It's one portrayal of the facts in a single text, collectively. So this is vital. And that's where I underlined it. And this is something that I, 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 I kind of wrote down for myself about as I was um, musing to myself and on how to explain this. A non-critical reader might read a history book to learn the facts of the situation, or to discover an accepted interpretation of those events. That's the first thing when we're talking about history. You ever get into those history debates? A critical reader might read the same work to appreciate how a particular perspective on the events and a particular selection of facts can lead to particular understanding. Now, this particular thing that I'm saying right here, what I'm saying is this is going to cut down circular and unneeded debates 
Because if you realize what you're actually doing, you're arguing over somebody else's thoughts. And you ain't got no way to prove what somebody else thinking. It's impossible to prove whether that person was thinking what they were thinking. You're going to go and look for somebody else's thoughts and somebody else's thoughts and somebody else. That's why the university was a school of the mind or what is called the nose. Actually, Jim James mentioned it in his book, my, one of my favorites, <laughs> is the nose, which is the N-O-U-S, the study of the mind. The nose then morphed into what is called gnosis, which is the study of intelligence, which leads to the ego, superego, which is very healthy for the mind to have a superego and an ego. W.E.B. Du Bois touched on it in a cultural way. He called it the double consciousness. Okay? Understanding the alt and the naught. So what a text does, says, and means. Well, non-critical reading is satisfied with recognizing what a text says and restating the key remarks. That's a non-critical reader. Have you done this yourself? I know I do. I still do it. I have to catch myself because I end up restating only the key statements. I playfully call it, you play in jeopardy. All you're doing is throwing factoids out there, but there is no cognate. For those of you who don't know, cognate means connection, and it's not consistent. You're just saying, I bet you don't know this, and I bet you don't know that. And you just throw abstract things out there, and you muse them together so that your rhetoric appears to be knowledgeable, similar to certain people with a pole and a light in their name. <laughs> Critical reading goes two steps further. Having recognized what a text says, it reflects on what the text does by making such remarks. This is what you do when you're reading critical to yourself. Is it offering examples? Is this arguing? Is this contextually arguing something? Is this appealing for sympathy? Is this making a contrast to clarify a point? And finally, critical readers then infer what the text as a whole means based on the earlier analysis. It's always about context, not content. The most important page on a book, and if a book doesn't have it, be very skeptical, is the introduction and forward. The introduction and forward will give you an understanding of what the book is, no matter what your personal opinion means. And no matter what somebody else tells about, it, about that book, if it's not cognate, to that forward and that introduction, they are speaking a fallacy. And usually they are appealing to authority. Okay? So when we talk about what a text does, says, and means, there are three steps or modes of analysis that are reflected in three types of reading and discussion. There are three types of reading, everybody, when you critically read. What a text says, that's the restatement. When you restate what somebody's already said and what you read, you didn't come up with it. You just restate it. You have certain people that brag about being a researcher and blah, blah, blah. And all they're doing is restating what they read. They don't have any knowledge of it. What a text does, actually being able to describe the quantum aspects of what you're restating. And what a text means, the proper interpretation with proper reasoning by means of inductive and deductive thinking and rationality, being able to deal with reality juxtaposed to your thoughts. Because reality is going to trump your thoughts every time. If you start going beyond reality, it is becoming abductive because you're taking a little bit of in what is being induced and a little bit of what you're deducing and you're creating your own synthesized fact. And for all we know, you could be way on Mars when we on Earth. You can distinguish each mode of analysis by the subject matter of the discussion. Now, this is how you quantify it and get into the quantum aspects of this. When I say what a text says, and we talk about the restatement, it talks about the same topic as the original text. That's what some of us do. What a text does, the description, discusses the aspects of the discussion itself, the entire context. What is the discussion and what are the problems in the discussion? Because as you read and you see a problem, identify it and write it down. That problem comes to be a question, i.e. equation. 
The root word of equation is equis, or to equate. It means to equal out, be able to see things clearly, or discover, breaking things down to its lowest meaning. That's very important when we get to the description of how to describe a text. What a text means, interpretation. Analyzing the text and it asserts a meaning for the text as a whole. So restatement, description, and interpretation are very important in critical reading. So we are back. Man, we made it. Do you see that? Do you realize we made it through the presentation? I feel special. <laughs> now we made it through the presentation. Um, so let let let's um the back chat before we open before I open the floor to the panel to give their expound um um on their interpretation. If you have any questions, um please feel free to ask. Um we're open to it. If you actually need to voice your opinion live. We'll gladly share the hangout for conjecture. It's no problem. Um, this is an ongoing series of advanced uh, teaching. So it's, this isn't it. There's so many facets in this pedagogy, so many facets of learning. So we've just begun. And so I've got a couple of series going here that I'm going to matriculate for you so that we go process by process. Like, comment, and subscribe. Share this with younger people. This is really designed for younger people in middle school and high school to assimilate this stuff because this is what's done on the college level. This is what's done with what people are called scholars, i.e. brilliant. They're really not. They understand critical methodology. And once they learn it naturally, they actually learn it in a methodical way by being taught it. Okay? So, this, so there are many different forms of intelligence, smarts, and all that stuff. So that's why you never let a person degrade you by telling you what you don't know. You need to be critical of the person that's really telling you that. Because are they meeting the criteria of being even knowledgeable um, in the first place? And I know some of this is difficult. Not difficult meaning we're smarter than you. No. <clears throat> what it means is, is that you need to watch this. Take time and assimilate this information. Take notes. Because like we've been saying, this is Team Osiris. We're going to bring work. I'm not going to talk about being an author and all that. I'm going to make sure that the people and, and the members of Team Osiris, the people that are subject to things, are going to hold the people that present it accountable. So we're giving you the tools to maintain fair playing ground. And now you're not going to get all these upstart authors and these brand new professors that are isolated and won't go up against nobody heavy. So this is important. But um, I'm, I'm going to open up the, um, the panel, man. I'm looking for that first question because it was real important by Criss Cross. Uh, well, while you find that, something I want to mention um, and go ahead. kind of touch base on it, it's, you know, a lot of times you get a lot of flack because, you know, when you see a peer present something that you necessarily don't approve of and you criticize, uh, you know, the work, not them, but the work. Uh, they they kind of, you know, they, they get out of pocket sometimes, they catch your attitude. And so a lot of times, especially if you stand alone with your with your criti criticism, uh, they, they think that it's just slander. But it becomes a real issue once people see for themselves and they're able to use these methods that you display tonight, uh, critical thinking and definitely critical reading. If they're able to assimilate for themselves based on a, a certain uh, set of, of, of rules and, and guidelines that, you know, okay, this may not be as accurate as I thought it would be, but I don't approve of this particular person's method or th their particular uh, mm -hmm. body of research based on various factors that might cause conflict. In the moment they're able to take responsibility for that and use that critical thinking and use that critical reading and criticize that work or better yet completely cut that person off because of that, that's when you're going to see a change in the community. 
because they're going to uphold people who have the balls to put out of, of work. They're going to uphold them to a certain standard. They won't let them go below. Right now, there is no standard. Thanks. You got all types of people teaching it on all types of stuff. Half of the people don't care. Other people want entertainment. There is no standard. And because there is no standard, there's no level of respect. And that's decency. right. And it, that's on the people. <coughs> we, a few people can try to uphold this standard, but if the people don't do it themselves, they're the ones with the power. If they don't do that themselves, then it's all for naught. That's right. That's factual, man. That's damn. Ain't too much to say after that. <laughs> because, see, there's a reason you set a standard in life, period. You have a standard when you go to kinder. You go to you have your child in kindergarten. There's a standard that you have to <laughs> that you have to follow. Um, and we as we as our peers, because we are oppressed, repressed people. We more than any other ethnic group of people have to hold a standard for each other. We have to do that. We can't let the illusion of inclusion put us in a position to allow people to give us subpar um, information and knowledge when we ask them to be taught. And we're doing it in humility. But this is the question that came from Chris Cross and a couple of the members of the team actually answered it eloquently. Um, and I think Menace wanted to touch on it. I just wanted to give my perspective. But it, the question is, um, uh, why is uh, astrology considered a pseudoscience by a majority of the scientific community? I mean, I don't knock people that study it or find ways that help that help with it. Now, when I first did this, I was um, um, trying to get the show back up, and I inadvertently answered a little too fast. Um, are you are you talking about brother Chris or, or sister Chris? I don't know. <laughs> are you talking about astrology, or are you talking about um, horoscopes and those kind of things. What are you talking about? What particular field of science are you talking about? Could you kind of put that in the uh, in the back chat? Because I want to be clear, but I'll open the floor for everybody else. I think I think I know I think I know what that person is talking about. I think they mean astrology. Um, okay. Astronomy is the study of the of the stars or, or yeah. you know what I'm saying or astro bodies. But yeah, I wanted to make sure. Astrology. Astrology is dealing with the horoscopes. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And so, I mean, yeah. um, I, I, I put it to you like this. I, I have I have it in my head, I have it in such a way where I could possibly answer that, but I don't think my answer would be clear and concise as someone who explains it all the time, like maybe a Neil deGrasse Tyson um, or, 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 or uh, someone like Kansu, uh, you know, speaks so eloquently. I'm talking about one of the reasons. <laughs> yeah, you know, I know one of the reasons. Like, really, you got to think about it like this: when it comes to astrology and the the particular signs, these are just signs put together uh, uh, by people and agreed upon. You know, in, in a certain in, in a certain field of someone saying this, that, and the other term. Uh, for uh, the effects that people attach to the uh, to to those signs, um, I'm looking for it right now. Farouk, while you're looking it. for it, could you touch on something so deep, man? How important is terminology? Do people could you let the people know in understanding a thing in like science? You really have to know terminology, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, terminology it, it helps put things in proper context. Because without terminology and you using certain words, it misunderstood, uh, uh, mis misconstrued a lot, you know. And honestly, I see that uh, happening a lot in this community. You know, people just don't clearly understand terms. Like something like pseudo, everybody thinks they have a good, they have a good uh, 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 crack on the word pseudo and they get it. But not really, because people don't even understand the meaning behind it. You know, you got to actually look these up and put these words, words like that into proper context okay. where you understand it. Uh, well, let, I, me, let, me give a, let me give a quick example of that. See, that's deep. That's what, when you said it, 
are people not really paying attention to what, how your brain is working right now, what it's matriculating on. And that's where people have to realize when you know someone is intelligent. Like Haru talking, that's intelligence. Let me tell you why. Because when we talk about words and, and culture and societies, the term pseudo, do you realize words like bling bling were recently in, in inserted in, into the dictionary? Hater is a new word in the dictionary. See, the dictionary is not the end all be all of empirical data. It's a reference book of diction. And cultural influence controls that book. So the, the conscious community has its own dictionary of terms. So when we say pseudo, it's not necessarily indicative to the denotative classical meaning of the word pseudo. That is called phonology and morphology in linguistics. And so that's when you hear people say they're linguists. Where did you study to be a linguist? Because are you being argumentative, subjective, objective? Are you being universal? Are you being analytic? What type of linguistics are you talking about? And what methodology are you using to come to your reasoning? That's being critical. So when we say the term pseudo, it is literally changing before our eyes as we speak. So when we say the term pseudoscience, it's because it does not apply to the applied sciences of physics because there's no physical, tangible ability to observe it. That doesn't mean that it doesn't have a science, a scientific approach to that, to the understanding of it, like the horoscopes. It still deals in the science of astronomy. It's in that field. But there's no physical data to validate it. So what science do, what scientists do, is they take a agnostic approach to it. And the scientists say, well, we won't spend our efforts trying to find a vehicle to equate it or give an equation to its validity. But a scientific theory or terms can be created against that. And that doesn't mean it can be proven in the physical realm. So horoscope or astrology cannot be proven scientifically by the laws of physics. But it still is a pseudoscience. It's a science, but it's a pseudoscience. Okay, so right. don't take the word pseudo and think we're just downing as astrology. We're not. We're putting it in its proper context. Go ahead, man. Exactly. Right, right. And I, I want I want you uh, while you're here and while I have a little bit of juice left on my uh, computer, I want you to pull up um, the definition of astrology. Oh, sure. Because, because sure. I think that is the most important because people have to understand why astrology is ruled out as pseudo. Remember, I told Chris in the chat, the reason why they ruled it out is because a lack of consistent evidence. There may be some evidence, but it's not consistent. And because it's not consistent, usually due to the lack of rules or, or regulations in which for like applied scientists, they have rules and regulations, then it's accepted. But because it, it doesn't... It what term did you want me to look up? I'm sorry. Uh, astrology. I got it. Okay. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Because, because, it, because it does not, because it's not consistent with any scientific rules or regulations, the, the method of studying it is scientific, but, the, but because of the lack of consistent, consistent results, it's going to be defined as pseudoscience. But astrology, astrology is a science. They just take the celestial bodies to a different lane in which it's not supposed to be in. You follow the divination and many other factors. That's where it falls short. And I think people have to um, when you say it's completely pseudo, you actually have to understand what we're talking about, why they rule it out as pseudo, and why people prefer ast astrology because it's accepted. Um, can I say something really quick? Um, I know it it, it deals with what's being said, and it's small before Kansu says what he says, and if I can elaborate later, I wish I can. Um, can I speak for the quick brothers? Oh, yeah, good. Go on, go on. Yeah, um, one thing that people have to keep in mind, um, and it took me a while to understand this too, and it goes with critical thinking. Critical thinking. You don't take concepts from 3200 BCE uh, 1500 BCE, um, 17 uh, CE, 1455 CE, 
obviously in Chris, Christopher has not lived in any of those periods. I've lived from 1986 up until the moment of right now. And how could I, although um, I'm very familiar with and I understand the methods of modern science, notice modern science, it's, you can say pseudo because of the moment of now, um, you, yeah, we, we figured things out. You can pick holes and things like that. But in that time period, within that context, within that moment of that period of now, that was a real moment back then. That was a real moment of now. So in that moment, fuck that, sh fuck no, that shit was a pseudo. You know what I mean? Because that was the current top of the, top of the line sciences at, the, at those time periods. So that whole pseudo thing to me, it's a, it's a, it's a very thin line, and I think it's been thrown around a lot lately, um, and people don't really know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. yep. Because yep. back then when people spoke about, really quick, I'm sorry, when people um, spoke about angels and demons and things like that, they were speaking about psychological concepts. But there were not words for psychology and things like that. You know what I mean? So some things, I mean, right. stay, in your right. lane, stay in your lane. That, that's, I'm a and, and you bring up something else. Cultural context can influence science. And science, as science grows, that cultural context gets dated. And, and th this is where the big divide is between culture and academia, because now the culture has sort of isolated themselves and kept the, 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 the clues or the ideas as to how something works. And you know, science. They said, "Oh well, we can't validate it, Mark." You know, a few a few years ago, you know, sucking out snakes' venom was working. Now it's pseudoscience. Now they validated reasoning to prove to you that it's unsafe and it and it doesn't actually fix anything. But give or take a few hundred years ago, it was actually widely world renowned that if you ever get bit by a snake and the snake has poison, suck it out. And everybody knows this because this is ancient science. Again, now it's pseudo, but at one point it was actually scientifically accurate. Science begins to grow, technology grows, and information gets recorrected, refined, and certain things have to fall to the wayside. But we have to understand that pseudoscience, the <coughs> term pseudo is not a definite. It's, a, it's always room for validation. There's a difference between pseudo and bullshit. We, we got to understand that in this community. There's a lot of bullshit out here that would never be validated by any sort of any type of scientific method. And then there's some pseudo information that, you know, you might need to, you know, let technology grow and we we'll have a different method on finding certain things. So that's something we definitely need to understand. One thing I want to do is when listening to, let's say I'm listening to what Chris has just said and what Melvin has just said, and I'm going to give you a working illustration. I am critically observing so that I can matriculate properly. So as I'm observing, what I start doing is classifying so that I don't scramble up my thoughts and they, the thoughts are smooth and cognate as I matriculate, as I create my thoughts, synthesize. What that is, is a training um, when you go on a master's program, depending upon what type, or you go into a PhD, a doctorate program, you actually talk these things. Um, in medieval times, they were called the trivium. Um, when you're matriculating this kind of information, I'm going to show you some definitive terms. And when, we're when you start, when your brain, when you train your brain to classify what you can teach your children right now, and you start teaching yourself, Raise your vocabulary. Your vocabulary is indicative. It is almost a requirement to your intelligence because when you hear a word, you classify it in a split second. And that helps you move on in your quest to know. I have, I have knowledge of. So your vocabulary, the greater it is, the greater that you can retain words to memory, definitions, the greater that you can handle what's being said to you and matriculate it down to its common meaning, okay? So when we talk about what Chris is talking about, let me tell you what Chris was saying. 
This is what we would do in high scholarship. Everybody see my screen? Yeah, we see it. And Christopher said, my now is my now. Understanding and being able to be critical, I already matriculated metacognition. I talked about metacognition earlier in the presentation. And what is it? Awareness and understanding of one's own thought process. So your thought process is indicative of your environment, isn't it? It's indicative of your circa, whatever that may be. So thinking in 2016 would not be thinking in 3100 BC. So you cannot apply proper metacognition by trying to say that you're going to assume a theory of how these people were thinking based on 2016 standards. You can't because you weren't there. That's immediate cognizance. Got it. He's talking yeah. metacognition. That's called classification because the brain likes to fire quickly. When the brain starts wandering and thinking, here comes the abduction. Abduction means you start getting things taken away from reality. And you start getting into musing, and then the hippocampus and the thalamus start playing with you because the amygdala is being blocked from doing what it's supposed to do. Short, quick responses. One plus one, two. Two plus two, four. Four plus four, eight. Eight plus eight, 16. 16 plus 16, 32. This is how the brain likes to work once it assimilates itself, and now it's now dissimulating and memorizing these things and it become that why you think you when you went to grade school you, you you learn the alphabet and you learn how to write it and you said it over and over again then you went to your timetables and you went there the numbers were listed in a row it's because that's the way the brain likes to matriculate and operate things when it uses the other senses to create a cognate environment okay so let's go to uh brother omega a brother by the name of omega I put a question, so pseudo is a cognitive and denotative term now. No, it's always been. I'm going to show you this again. The cognitive definition, I'm going to get into the definition of astrology. When we look at um, connotative, not cognitive, forgive me. In dictionary.com, I'm using them. It's an adjective. And it means of a word or an expression, because even expressions change. A thumbs up in America is nice. A thumbs up in certain parts of the world is screw you. Okay? That's, that's, an, that's a connotative expression that can change. Okay? Based on a cultural norm and belief. And I'm going to give you some empirical data, okay, everybody, on the elements of culture in a moment. But adjective of a word or expression signifying or suggestive of an associative or secondary meaning in addition to the primary meaning. Let's use it in a sentence. A connotative word such as steely would never be used when referring to a woman. That's how it's used in a sentence when we say connotative. So yes, the pseudo term that is denotative as being a sham has now been given new meaning when it started being used in different forms of science. Because those sciences were used by academia, but over a period of time, they became dated because technology created tools that usurp the need. So when we get to astrology, it is the study of the movements and relative positions of celestial bodies, planets, interpreted as having an influence on human affairs and the natural world. The synonyms are horoscopy and horoscopes. As Brother Heru eloquently uh, made clear, astronomy and astrology are close but are not quite the same. And this is a Greek methodology. How do we know? Because in the lexicon of, la of linguistics, its origin is Greek. So we know that the Greeks created a, met a methodical norm and belief system around astrology and spoke this word as a cultural norm and denotative. And then it became connotative in Latin and Old French and then was adopted furthermore connotatively by the English in the natural form and in the judicial form. Henceforth, Middle English with Latin Vulgate. But if you don't understand linguistics and proper terminology, it's going to sound 
Just like, well, you trying to match up words. What is this? It doesn't work like that. When you read the dictionary, it has phonetics and dates and times for a reason. There is a order into even using a book of diction. When we look at the definition of denotation, really quick, <clears throat> it means having the power to denote or denoting or tending to denote, the origin of denotative, okay? So that is the beginning, the word origin, okay? I think one of the, one of the panels wanted to speak, or panel members. Did somebody want to say something? No, I was, yeah, that was me. I was going to say uh, I'm glad you brought that part up because <clears throat> that's one thing uh, about the field of linguistics. I think that people, they don't really understand. It, it, it's deeper than just trying to match words up or trying to match similar sounding words because that's not always a, a, a definite, especially when you have two language families that are so far apart from each other. You know, how can you just make or how can you draw draw an inference on two words that sound similar when even these people would never have even at any point in history been in contact with each other? Like I, I, I'll use this for example. Um, we are we all are familiar with the term Mother Nature, and most of us are also familiar with Metal Nature, which is from the uh, Egyptians. You have someone like a brother polite who will take who will say nature is cognate to mother nature because they sound the same, but that's not that's not true at all. You know, you're talking about two you're talking about two different languages that are thousands of years apart. apart. You know, so I mean it, it, it is deeper than trying to match up words. You know, uh, I just wanted to make uh, make that point really quick. Hey, hey Rudy, thank you for saying that, bro. Thank you for saying that, bro. Let me say something real quick, too. Go ahead, bro. Um, since we're going to talk about pseudos, um, there's a thing called pseudolinguist. Pseudolinguist. Um, just because, as Heru mentioned, just because you can take, let's say, ancient Egyptian or um, what is known cause of um, ancient Arcadian, which is another dead language. It's not just ancient Kemet. Ancient Arcadian. Um, ancient cuneiform. We can take these different languages, and just because you can find modern words that may appear to match up, doesn't mean that they're related to these languages. And you can sit here and play all these games, but at the end of the day, it's still pseudo linguist. It's pseudo linguistics, because matching words don't mean anything because just because a word matches it doesn't mean that that's the exact word and it doesn't mean it's the origins because a lot of times you have exchanges between different cultures and sometimes there's borrowings so and that's for something for the future but i want to say that because a lot of people on facebook and on social media i'm not gonna lie i don't call nobody out but a lot of people are very pseudo linguist and they just make it up as they go and they play the the sound of like uh, a mitch and match game you know, and it's crazy. Now I want to I want to add on to <coughs> why Brother Haru knew that when he heard Mother Nature is or uh, was supposed to be um, Meadow Netter, or they were supposed to be cognizant of each other. The reason why he figured out that they weren't the same was, in fact, what we are talking about today, and he used uh, critical thinking. The way that you critical think is at the meta nature or what um uh, we have, um, have that trait. look for a, a cognitive in that to see if it has anything with motherhood uh is it is it anything to do with a mother uh and it's not madu is itself is uh, words. So it has nothing to do with mother. So in that, in that I see that it couldn't be mother. So even though the nature, uh, some people say is deity, 
some people associate deity with nature, that uh, people at that time associated deity with nature, we still can't deductively say that meta nature means mother nature. So that would be a process of critical thinking. So um, anytime that you are using the process of critical thinking is look at both sides of the story. It actually always three sides of one, the truth. When you look at uh, both sides of the story first, before you even get to the truth, you want to look at um, uh, one person's position. One person's position, they're gonna ha they might have a whole thesis on their one person. But you also, at that same time, want to follow and see if anybody has made a thoughts under, under the sun. So you want to see, is it any opposition to that person's position? And you have to take that into consideration. So when you take these two into consideration, the position and the opposition, then you can deduct and make a, a one is correct or what is correct to you. Because now perception comes into play. Now, if you're using your critical thinking skills, you would take everything that you need from the original position, everything that you need from the opposition, and see what points actually validate what you're looking for, which is the, like I said before, you have one side of the story, the other side, and the truth. And once you validate, you become a, a person of knowing, a person of truth. So, um, yeah, uh, Haru hit on a good spot for me uh, to, to bring that forth. Yes, yeah, so a person, uh, Brother Omega asked a question. Um, he was asking about speed reading. And I did that for a little while, but it became irritating. But it is actually a really good um, skill. Um, to speed read. And one of the issues with speed reading, Brother Omega, <clears throat> let me let me let me see if I can find your question to be able to let's see if I can find it, problem. Hold on, bear with me, y'all. Yeah, speed reading versus normal reading. I won't be able to address this properly. Um the difference, there's a difference, and that's what it, that's the opinion. And this is one of the worst things that we do when we're being taught elementary reading. We get taught to read out loud because we get taught phonetically how to read. You don't necessarily need phonics to know how to read if you're auditory, because you can hear the word and actually retain its meaning and eventually get to begin to say it, because your mind talks before your voice does. So your mind will say a word, and then in, in, in faster than a second, it's not even fathomable how fast this happens, your vocal cords engage based on your cognitive ability. What that is called is sub-vocalization, Brother Omega. Look up sub-vocalization. And what that means is, you know how when you're reading, you're talking in your head? If you want to be much better in your reading and read much faster, stop doing that. Because as fast as you talk in your head, as fast as you're going to retain the information. The brain is an amazing thing and how it works with the psyche. So condition yourself to not sub-vocalize, meaning you're reading and then in your head you're talking while you're reading the words. Glance over the words and only deal with the meaning. So it's thought without observ observation of thought. Because when you start fact-finding, looking, that's when you're going to have issues with that. So you can read things in context very quickly and get your assumption. It's just like Chris was, was talking, and once I could, could, could be cognate of what he was saying, I didn't need to hear nothing else he was talking about. Now I could listen objectively and respectively and let him continue 
to break down through rhetoric what he was meaning. But I automatically knew metacognition. Boom. Got it. Now, some other bad, somebody next to me might not have gotten it yet. So they need to hear him further. But those who are quicker, usually by the aid of vocabulary and experience and training, you get the meaning right away. If somebody is saying something that's a bit um, abstract, okay, is that a neo neoist approach to something? Is that new? You know, you automatically categorize things so that you can recollect things quicker and you actually do read faster. So it's called sub-vocalization, bro. Sub-vocalization. Um, another question I see out here is the brain and the mind. No, it's not. The mind is the activity of the brain's physical, physiological action. So the mind is a byproduct of the brain's physiological action. There are muscles and regions of the brain that are responsible for the creation of the mind. <clears throat> so that's very important that um, that, be, uh, that be understood. Uh, anyone else on the panel want to expound um, any further yeah, on the subject? Matter? Yeah, go ahead, bro. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, for one, uh, uh, as a child, um, I remember there, and I'm just going to use a quick reference because I like the title. There's a, a Japanese anime called Ghost, uh, Ghost in a Shell, you know? Um, and I kind of feel like, you know, we, we're, we're, we are ghosts in a shell um, in an introverted aspect. But what, but what I mean by that is that all things, and it goes, you know, with the, with, with the brain and the mind. You would have no mind without the brain. The mind did not produce the brain. The brain produced the mind. You know, other creatures in existence do have brains. You know, that, 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 you know, I hope that's known, you know. <laughs> but just because you have a brain doesn't mean that you can do what we as human beings can do. You can't self-reflect on the universe. We are the universe thinking about the universe. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm um, digress and go back. But all of the five senses from smelling, um, sight, hearing, uh, taste, uh, touch. If I missed one, I think I, I did sell five, but if I missed one, I apologize. All those are connected throughout the body, through the nervous system, through um, the hands, the way that the um, palms and the uh, feet are designed um, to be able to detect heat and uh, cold. Um, and moisture and certain things like that are all designed by the brain. It sends electrical impulses throughout the whole body, but you don't even realize what the fuck's going on. I apologize. You don't even realize what's going on until, you know, it hits the brain. So you can sit there all day, you know what I'm saying, and chill like, you know, oh, the mind, the mind, the mind, but without the brain, there is no mind. I just want to say that. Definitely, man. Well said. Uh, anyone else is open to uh, conjecture? On that particular question, no, not at all. Uh, I think Brother Chris, I was profound with his response. Okay. I, th I, st I think we got to do a show on that. Uh, you know, get, get Brother Heru on here. Heru on here. And, and definitely uh, tag team. You know, the mind, you know, conversation, actually break that down, what, what it does. Maybe even dabble in our uh, neuroscience. Oh, yeah, that would be that would be nice. Um, I just got to, I want to shout our brother, um, Ashano Tap. I don't know who you may be formally. Of course, you're keeping yourself anonymous. Um, I see you've been in a couple of my classes when I taught at my Masonic Lodge. So shout out to you, bro. Well, you may be as good to be able to connect to people on here. Once again, the internet, man, this YouTube vehicle, you never realize who you're talking to and um, who you speak to. And it's good when uh, people acknowledge you for the work that you've done in the past. And it also helps for the damn haters that be talking shit and I think somebody uh, not who they think they are. Uh, unfortunately, Timo Cyrus guys, we, we some real guys. Um, so... I do appreciate that, uh, brother, and uh, big ups to you, too. Um, oh, Pastor, let me address something real quick. I'm sorry. Hold on. This was in the back chat. I'm tired of, of y'all niggas. Hold up. 
Uh-oh. Y'all are going by European dogma force thinking. I am you. Uh, can you explain what you mean by that? Ask, ask, ask that person what country do they live in? Where was they? Yeah, yeah. matter of fact, where are you at? And and hold on, wait. They type. Hold on. They obviously type their um question in English. So yeah, that kind of defeats the purpose. You speak Indo-European language. Why are you speaking Indo-European language if you're so African? And Chris Cross, um, I'm gonna address um because I'm not gonna um type all that in the comment. But that will be addressed um, in, in, in one of our uh, next shows very recently. Or you can uh, get a hold of me on Facebook. I'm not hard to find. Trust me. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give IMU the benefit of the doubt that he was playing devil's advocate there. Um, because I actually was going to mention that earlier. Um, that there, that is a scapegoat in the black conscious community that tends to use genetic fallacies as an argument to being intelligent, articulate, and responsive in a traditional fashion. Because for some type of reason, it is a false impression that we are not affected by white supremacy. That we actually don't use our oppressor's own methodologies of self-discovery. That we don't tend to realize that archaically and anciently, or anciently, whichever word you choose, we didn't have the need to discover ourselves because we were already in harmony with nature. This byproduct of studying the human being, studying the history of the existence of human beings through anthropology, archaeology, biology, these sciences, is a European methodology because the European had to discover their origin because they knew that our ancestors that were melanated and in that region called Africa were the original people, okay? That's all that means. So the European had to have an identity. And once they understood their identity and their role, they then usurped other cultures in lieu of that. Some may call it inferiority. So we understand white supremacy, white domination. We're very clear of that. But we also know that to function in society, Let's say if we were coming up with a plan. If for 400 years I spoke English, or for another 1,000 years we spoke Ugandan, all of that was under supremacy rule. We tend to take for granted how long 100 years is. Now multiply that times five. Now try multiplying it by times 30. Recorded history is thousands of years old. And so in this, in this exchange, we tend to put up false arguments like race. Race is a social political creation by humans, okay? But the scientific fact is race is, be, is merely genetics, not skin color, not super melanin, not none of that, none of that. Race is a social political creation, okay? That's it. And so when we start dealing with things like this, it does get kind of, you know, touchy because you don't talk black or you don't act black or you don't, what is that? Exactly. What is acting black? What is talking black? How do you talk a color? <laughs> so, um, forgive me, I'm getting some protein. Um, so that, that remains to be seen. That, that's a genetic fallacy. There's nothing, um, there's nothing congruent about that in regards to being conscious and intelligent. How can you call yourself black and conscious, but you're ignorant at the same time? Makes no sense. That's not cognate. If you're saying you're conscious, that means that you see things. What it is is people are not conscientious when someone is critical of them because they're being held to what they say and do. So I really think IMU was trying to be, trying to, uh, be devil's advocate there. Um, nah, don't give him that much credit, Castle. Don't give him that much. I'm gonna give him. I'm gonna give it to him. I'm, 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 both of y'all, yeah, both of y'all made a great point because you can't talk a color, but you can talk a construct. So, as Kasu mentioned, black itself is a construct. So, yeah, you can talk a construct, and that's what they mean, I guess. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, y'all, y'all, y'all can give them a pass, but I'm telling you right now, the concept of black and white is European at its core. <laughs> So, so the very thing that you try not to be subliminally, you're actually co-signing it. Good luck. Yeah, and that's why I say devil's advocate only because maybe he wants us to talk about this. Maybe he wants <laughs> us to expound about this um, in a manner that maybe will wake some people up. But that, that's that's circa 1960. Um, you know, that's it, it's a totally different. Yeah, sure. Totally different. Go ahead, bro. Uh, <laughs> Information yeah, is about about easy to come by. You can't just give me a book called Behold the Pale Horse. You can't just give me that book and tell me it's factual. You can't do that anymore. No. I like the book. It sounds real good. It sounds excellent, man. It sounds real exciting. You know, it's engaging. It gets you involved. But unfortunately, technology caught up with the book. And a lot of the conspiracies that claim to have happened didn't. When the pale horse came out, he was saying this date and this time is going to happen. And it never happened. So what does that do to the theory? It's over. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and speaking of Behold a Pale Horse, um, you know, it's dealing with conspiracy theories, obviously. Um, now, who wrote, who wrote the book, uh, pale, uh, A Pale Horse? European. A European wrote the book, mm-hmm. so came up with a lot of these concepts out of his own head, right? So mm-hmm. is you got people like the guy who who said that we're using European this that and the other. You got people like him taking that book literally as as it's like like as it is godlike, and they bring that to the con- the black conscious movement. And swerving down is real. How does that? Mm-hmm. How does that even work? How, I, <laughs> I don't even understand how that even works. Like right now, my head is 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 confused just even trying to link that together. <laughs> you know, my, my question my question to people like that is: using European terminology, a European methodology, a European understanding, then where is your African understanding mm-hmm. of all these concepts and things? Where is your methodology? Why why has no one shown this methodology? Why why is not why is this not the standard? Where is that at? Well, well, go ahead. I'm I'm gonna expound in a minute. Go ahead, Earl. Go ahead. No, I, I, that that was the question. That was the, that was the question I was asking. Oh, I don't think it can be answered fairly. I think that, that to answer it would mean you mean you're biased. Um. Some things are best left alone because a lot of this information you just don't have. It's just like people talk about Kemet as if those people were over there being pro-black in 3100 BC. But they weren't. And the same Europeans you're mad at, they weren't mad at them. Why are you mad at them? They coexisted with them. We said in the last show, where did the African come from? Mars? If they're Dutch, where's, where's Holland? It's in Sweden, right? <laughs> so how the hell did the Dutch gene get all the way South Africa? Past where mankind started. How come the Africans didn't kill these yeah, guys when they got I'm, there? Yeah, I'm actually black Dutch. So, so, right, how is that possible? Social constructs, racism started circa 1450. Before that, they didn't, it wasn't classified. There wasn't enough acts of it to even understand what that was. At that point, it was survival before then. The social political effects of commerce isolated a certain particular group of ethnic group of people, us, because we didn't have the resources. And the resources we did have, they were spread out. And they were sparse and thin. First don't always mean you're going to remain in power. That's just like the Model T Ford. If you bring a Model T Ford, the first car, and you bring a 2016 Dodge um, Ford Mustang, 
Which one you think I'm going to choose? Not because of the model, but because of the effectiveness. You think I'm going to take the Model T Ford, even though it was the first car of all cars? Does that make it the best car? That don't make any sense. There's no cognate. See what I'm saying? There's no, there's no logic to that. In 2016, I'm going to ride around in a Model T Ford. Well, people walking faster than I'm driving. Makes no sense. So if you don't know how to take control of your own thought process, you become a slave. <clears throat> this is why there's no cognate, no cognate in the Greeks. Most of the stuff that um, romantists argue over about the Greeks, I'm telling you, just do the research. You'll see the cognate. Greeks probably didn't even exist as we know them. There's a lot of they even call themselves of, Greeks. <laughs> I was they, just going there, man. They never called call themselves, themselves that. They were a select tribe of people that stuck to themselves. Hmm. They had a name for themselves, too. And they were Greek. <laughs> that was given to them. <laughs> Some of you that argue religion, I know you don't like this. You probably won't. But the Judean culture, the Palestinians, directly after the Persian invasion, is the closest religion we were subject to in modern form. And then it became an issue with the um, Catholic religion, the Romans, because they, they didn't want to deal with the vassals. I mean, world history says it. It has nothing to do with the Bible. That's personal. But if you're not matriculating that data and you're taking it personal before you even read it, it's impossible that you're going to learn it. It's, it's impossible. Let me see if we got questions. Go ahead, man. No, I was about to say, um, you know, I think people in this community fail to understand that it's... Oh, that's right, Shesmu. You're right, Shesmu. Forgive me. What happened? No, Shesmu corrected. The Holland is in the Netherlands. Sweden and Norway are a little bit north of that. I'm sorry about that. I about to say that uh, people got to realize, man, that it's 2016, and they trying to live off concepts that they barely even understand from 3100 BC. The world don't operate like that no more. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, we're in a whole different ball game. At the end of the day, man, we got to move with the times. We're gonna get left behind, and I'm sorry. This community and the way it's operating right now, I just see it getting left behind. It's almost like it's it's, it's in the dark ages. Almost, it's like. I don't see any forward. <clears throat> I, I see us making a concerted effort to move forward, to talk about certain issues, to talk about certain topics, to get people to understand certain things, and to open their mind and expand them. But a lot of these people want to live in the past, and then they so close-minded where they don't even understand a lot of the things that's even going on in today's time. Mm -hmm. Well, we got to go. Oh, go ahead, brother. Yeah, he makes a good point and it makes a good point also with, with the main topic um, is nomenclature yeah of course Ah, uh, you break you breaking up, man. It's, you're breaking up really bad, man. Um, from then to now, menace. It's two different type of worlds, brother. And menace, you're, you're breaking go up. Ahead. Really go bad. ahead, brother. No, your signal is real bad. Okay, you hear me now? Okay, all right. So, um. Uh, what we can tell uh, by using critical thinking um, as, as far as um, literature and even with uh, verbal speech, we can look at uh, the Old English compared to the Americana that we speak now. Um, in the Old English, you had uh, words that they use commonly, like they, uh, like, like thou um, or whatnot. And we don't use that in this day and age. So... Um, yes, we can kind of put our mindset to try to figure out what they mean, and we can get very close, but 
we understand what time set that those people are in and we are in. And that gives us a certain amount of critical thinking and uh, ability to, um, to, to, to scientifically figure out if something can be broken down in our own understanding or not. Or it, or it can it only be broken down in an understanding of the time frame that it was in. Yeah, well said. Um, I do want to address a couple questions. I'm going to open it to the panel to address these questions too. I heard the term Orisha mentioned. When you get into a uh, Yoruban religion, particularly Ifa um, and uh, Palo, or what it's called, um, Palo Mayambi in the Congo, of Africa. Um, it is a modern, but one of the, old, the oldest modern religion in, in, uh, in Africa. And it is a means of mental therapeutics. Um, and I'm summing, okay, I'm classifying so that we don't get into a drawn out diatribe. It is a means of communal healing as the priests were doctors at that moment. And they were prescribing medicines along with mental um, stimulation to give you mental healing as well as physical healing with herbs and things of that nature. That's why you get the term the medicine man, the witch doctor, okay? So um, uh, the Ifa culture dealt in the mental and physical or metaphysical aspects of religion in, in spirituality through totems, okay? So it's a little different than the monotheistic religion of totems. It's a bit different because those are politically, um, those are political uh, ideologies that were enforced with totems. So it's a little different, just a little. Okay, and there was a lot of pressure with Yoruban religion because they were forced into a lot of the colonizers' uh, religions. And the colonizer then usurped the knowledge of uh, Yoruban uh, culture and actually wrote a lot of books on Ifa. You're gonna see more Europeans writing books on Ifa than the actual African people because they kept it a secret. And they only gave so much out to those people. So when we talk about Ifa and those, and those priests of that time, that correlates into the next question talking about masonry. Masonry is the building of the mind. The master builder is an allegorical term, okay? And it alludes to the building of the mind, the knowledge of self. That's what it alludes to. It became modernized and, and took on connotative actions to Europeans that observed the ancient practices of masonry. They gave it the term masonry because it was a modern coinage. It was a modern coinage or phrase because a mason was an architect, a builder. They would build buildings and things like that. Those buildings would be allegorically, they don't even use the term allegory anymore modernly, but they would be allegorically referred to as human edifices. So that's why those things um, are categorized under the term masonry. But in Africa, masonry would not be an organic term, okay? It wouldn't be that. But because we're American, we adopt Americana. We have no option. We don't have a archaic marker to define or give us an identified center of Africanism. We had to create technologies like Afrocentricity. That is a social, um, political, technical aspects of how we operate as Africans because we didn't have access to Africa itself, the continent, okay? So that is the classification of these things. You have to be able to classify this stuff, man, before you expound on it. And that's the only fair thing. I think the other uh, question was, um, uh, for the panel, because I know you guys want to talk about this. Physics can trump the mental. The mental. That's a, that's a, that's a deep one. So uh, uh, go ahead. Probably Melvin or Menace or anyone. I know hey, all of you are going to hey, say something. About that. <laughs> hey, uh, I, I just watched a lecture today on physics. I'm going to tell you right now. Oh, the one I do. <laughs> Hell no. Listen, listen, listen. <laughs> but that, that professor impressed the hell out of me with his tactics to get the, the students to to think that they were mentally you know equipped to deal with 
certain physics problems. And it was just amazing to see that it wasn't the physics that tricked him, it was him. <laughs> so, you no, know, no, the mind is far too complex and to even measure it and put, put you know, boxes around it. Uh, e even in neuroscience, in any field of, of mental science or brain science, the, the, the brain always changes. It always shifts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when, when, you, when, you, when you cut it, when you, when, you, when you add things to manipulate it, it always changes. So it's never going to be the same. It always changes things right now. Science is trying to figure out the mind. I, I, I shared an article uh, yesterday from Telegraph uh, that they, they, where they were finally able to start reading the mind. They did, this is where they, this is the, the, the borderline of, of where science is at. So no, there's no way that, that physics can out jump the mind. There's no way. So science is still trying to figure that out. <laughs> Uh, OD says he comes with irreducible complexity. He says that you're using the same excuse for understanding God is far too complex. So now we're getting into irreducible complexity. Right, so <laughs> if, it's, if, it's, if it's not complex, the, 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 what is the solution for the change in, in, in the, 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 the biological as well as mental makeup of a person once they come out of testing, and they're no longer the same. The tests are inconclusive. They have to continue to make tests, and each test is always going to be different, producing different results. I think that defines complex. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, uh, good conjecture, though, OB. We, we feel you, bro. I was about to offer a slightly different, uh, slightly different uh, opinion on that. Yes, um, sir. You know, um, I, I, I embrace science, you know, who the thing is, as of right now, no. You know, physics does not trump the mind. As of right now, no, it doesn't. But that, that, that doesn't mean that in some point in the future that it, it, it may, because you never know. Correct. I agree. I, I agree. I, I, I want to say this. I, I agree. I agree. I agree 100%. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Melvin, you hit the nail on the head. Right now, too complex. We can't figure it. Absolutely. It's at this moment, we don't have a clear grasp, but it doesn't mean that within the next hundred years it can be figured out. You know, we got to understand science and how it's properly applied. Uh, people, people don't have a good understanding of what science is and what it does and what it can tell. Man, I think that issue at you know, science, does, science never claims. If you pay attention to actual scientists and how they work. They never claim to know everything, you know, or, or the field of science never claims to know anything. This is a means or a method by which we put things, we, we test things to figure things out. So you got to think, 150 years ago, when Darwin was formulating his theory of evolution, I bet back then people were calling him a, a pseudoscientist. I bet back then people were like, you're crazy, you're mad, you sound, you sound out of this world. But now, here it is 150-some years later, we have a firm grasp on it. We have more evidence than, than you can even imagine about explaining this concept of the theory of evolution. So you got to understand, some things, when we say things like uh, our pseudoscience, maybe, maybe at some point in the future, it could be explained to a way where it actually becomes actual science. You know, and, and this is also, this also ties into that question we're dealing with the mind. Right now, we can't figure it out. But who's to say within 100 years, hey, we might have it all figured out. We might be able to understand the human brain better than we did now at our current point. And I just wanted to add that to that. Yeah, I do, I do yeah, want to if say. We, if, we, if, we agree, if we agree that the mind is a byproduct of the brain, we can look at scientific uh, uh, phenomena that happened, I want to say it was, it was the mid-night, no, it wasn't the mid-night, it was the early 2000s, where it was a Frenchman, no, no, yeah, um, the, it was, it was this, it was this last year, um, and 90% of his brain, 
that was eaten away by a disease. Within his brain, his neurons reconnected, able to fight. So, like Melvin said earlier, the mind always finds a way to remanipulate itself. So, if we are always at a, a evolution point with the mind, and we are always at a constant uh, manipulation point to where the mind uh, finds ways to still conduct itself, then no, there's no way the physics can trump the mind. And that, that is that is proof. Uh, Meech, um, I'm going to say can, uh, You can go into, yeah, they can go into science alert. I just want to give them the uh, thing. It's a uh, science alert is without 90% of his brain. You can just look that up and uh, you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I want to address them real quick. I saw something in the back chat um, earlier. And when I had um, was discussing about the brain, the mind, the senses, and our, how things are interpreted and um, input and output, you know, and which deals with your expression of reality, um, someone asked in the back chat, um, I think it may be the brother Chris Cross, he asked, um, okay, I explained about the brain and the mind, but now he said, okay, but <clears throat> do thoughts, thoughts. Are thoughts products of the brain or the mind? And I'm glad that was brought up. Um, again, the brain is the hardware, the machine. The fact, um, and mind you, other creatures in um, on on Earth have that same hardware. It may not be so complex in ours. Some may be more complex in ours. We can't understand it, but. That, that hardware, what we call brain, that technology that we... Let me, let's get something. Something needs to be clarified, too. What we call nature, natural things, um, even though we produce um, synthetic products um, in reality, does not make it any um, less natural than natural products. Because you have to understand something. We all exist in one reality, and it's us being humans. It's true. It's true. It's the next level. So... So, um, again, um, dealing with the whole brain thing and the whole factor is, is that that hardware is not only dealt with in, in mankind, but with mankind, this is what occurs, is that the hardware allows us to be able to reflect upon ourselves. So it's like the universe is able to look um, in the mirror, you know? And what you call thoughts are byproducts of the mind, not the brain. The mind comes from the brain. A thought itself comes from the mind. I've never seen any um, catalog or sections inside the physical, the physical human brain where certain thoughts are. Now, certain things may light up with electrical impulses, but thought itself, you can't really necessarily pinpoint certain thoughts. That makes any sense. It's a very deep subject, and it's not something that could be discussed in like five or ten minutes. Right, uh, I agree, and I want to I want to speak on that as well. Um, we have to understand thoughts. You know, and Chris Chris spoke about the breakdown of the senses and those those electromagnetic impulses. Those impulses are influences. The, the difference between a man. And a monkey, of course, is always going to be the brain, but it's 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 based on the influence, possible in its in its setting, in its habitat, in its environment, in its own social structure. So it's going to perform like that consistently. Therefore, there's no need for new influence. The only time that there is new influence, which is going to produce new results, whether whether recognized by the senses or if another warns them is if a predator, a, a, a predator prey situation comes in and they're at the bottom of that totem pole whereas they have to actually do more focus on surviving rather than just living in their natural habitat. The thing humans is that we've, we've moved from their habitat. We weren't stagnant. It's important because understand the process of evolution the one thing that's always consistent 
is the, is the consistent evolution of the mind and the senses. And so each each impulse, each sense, creates a new uh, um, a new a new influence on that on that, that species mind. So they're able to react differently. Humans react differently to certain things physically as well as mentally than monkeys do or apes or gorillas or pet dogs or fish because they have different influences. See, the animal kingdom has consistency, but, but in, in man, in his societal structure, in his environment, which he plays a part in, there is no consistency. He, he has free will, so to speak. So things are going to consistently change. So the brain is going to be consistently advancing to adapt to those changes because there's going to be new influences consistently. So these thoughts are all based off of influences that you learn to adapt to on a consistent basis. And that all exists in the mind because the, those senses help relate back information to the brain. And it hits forth. Now, you know, when you're in a cold situation, you need to get somewhere warm or you need to start a fire. When you get in a situation where fear comes into play, you need to get somewhere safe or you need to find a way to retaliate. These are thoughts, but they, they played in a role in which the brain uses the senses as influence to create those thoughts. Hey, Brother Melvin. Yes, sir. Peace and love, bro. Let me say something real quick. And this is very honest to the audience. People don't really understand this shit. We can only speak about the things that the audience can comprehend. We want to come so fucking hard. We want to, like, we want to, like, really go, like, we really want to put out the information. But we can only put out what the public can comprehend. So keep that in mind. And if you support us, show so put it out there and the more you support us I promise you we have information I'm telling you I, I will fuck you up like seriously like you niggas will be bugged out for like months like like true information like seriously support us like really get it popular I say I say now nah, nah, what they both spoke about what they both spoke about was the uh, the, the census um, we have five senses, but um, the the amalgamation of those five senses creates a six. Um, that sixth sense, um, to not sound pseudo, since we were talking about pseudo earlier, that sixth sense is uh, the ability your foresight or, or the ability to critical think. Um, if we look back at original. Um, um, Version site, you could go back. Uh, I like to read to y'all um, about Prometheus. Uh, Prometheus, the, um, the principle. Right. So, uh, Prometheus was the son of a type of Lepitus, the power of foresight. Prometheus wisely others whenever he could. When the Olympians Opposed the Titan, uh, Prometheus' foresight showed him that Zeus would suit it to rule the Chronicles. Sided with the Olympians and brought his brother uh, Epictetus. Uh, hold on, Epimetheus. Uh, with a battle, uh, Prometheus served uh, as trusted advisor to Zeus. His foresight could predict the future. So it's not really saying that he was like a it's like a, a soothsayer, if we must. Uh, it's not saying that he was like that, but he was able to gauge his surroundings and get uh, uh, people's behavior. The outcomes might occur. It's not always a. It's not always a a a, a, a definite, but he could gauge an outcome that might occur. I have a hard time watching movies because I have this Prometheus uh, view when I have this critical thinking that happen next. And most of the time, um, it comes out accurate. 
Um, so, um, let's trust the Prometheus. Uh, the king could operate the man, and he assigned Prometheus to the task. Prometheus used clay. This are uh, some other um, religions and stuff like that. But uh, uh, Prometheus used clay from the banks of the river and created new men. He gave them the task of creating animals, other um, which means like task of creating animals um, and whatnot. So what Melvin was saying earlier is that other, uh, and also Chris mentioned it too, other animals, they might have to be similar to ours as human beings or as homo sapiens sapiens, which is they might have that are similar to us, as we can see within the dolphin, but still, still they don't have what we have. The ability to use all of your senses to try to have a situation or to try to have foresight, they have, and that's the difference between wildlife. So, um, uh, he, he, he tasked his, uh, his brother with creating the, uh, the app. Animals. Using his foresight, Prometheus made an image of the gods. He breathed life into them, and he stirred into his Prometheus love each one. So he, he he created them with foresight. So I'm not saying that this story is, but it's showing you they have something that's different. Than animals. Animals can remember and they can say, all right, yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm not going to go in that bush anymore because my cousin went to that bush and he got ate. All right, cool. We have forced uh, take all of our senses. And I ever went in that bush and got ate. But we can uh, see that that bush is battling a little bit and, can, and, and use conductive reason to see rattling because of the predator in there and not go to that bush or uh turn holes go across and we can say oh damn i ain't gonna drink from this water it might be alligator in there so um our foresight in certain points so to think can also save your life it's not just a, a thing of uh, uh being into our eyes it's the thing about being in Intelligent is something. We need this as a people. So uh, I digress from that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, we do have, um, the back chat is lit up, but people are really conversing back and forth with each other. And that's good. When you start talking about um, thought, this is what creates that. When you start getting into um, critical thinking and you start dealing in the aspects of it. It gets rid of the ego or the egotistical actions of us people because we can be very egotistical. Let me, let me say this, um, and I think someone in the back chat mentioned it earlier. There is no absolute truth, not in science, not in anything. There's no absolute truth. Uh, all a person can do is walk on a quest of discovery, generally self-discovery. Once you're um, comfortable with yourself, you can address the other phenomena in this universe. So self-discovery is, is premium. It is the most important aspects of our psyche, is the discovery of the self. The, the means of other um, isms that we place upon each other are really psychological issues due to our environment. And some of us, we cannot help it. And this is why we have to eliminate the arguments that we have as black people over knowledge. It's ridiculous and it doesn't make sense. It's only knowledge, and knowledge will change based on any given criteria at any point in time. Live long enough and watch knowledge change. Watch norms change. It's, you know, at my age, I've seen things that was not acceptable 20 years ago, and now it is. So the longer you live, you're going to be able to have more retrospect on this life that you're living. This knowledge and these books and this information are things that you can be reflective on, objective but be, be warned of your subjectivity because a lot of times it's only in your, literally only in your mind, <laughs> what, you, what you think you know, okay? It is only in your mind. Be more objective 
respect who is speaking, be objective, and let the information speak, not you. Let the information speak for itself. That way, emotions and biases don't come into play. So uh, with that being said, man, we appreciate everybody that tuned in. As usual, tune in. Um, you know, when you see that alert on your phone or you see that alert on your computer, you know you're getting ready to get some information, man. Um, you can reach us at www.teamosiris.com. You can reach us at Team Osiris on Facebook. Um, Team Offset on Facebook. Shout out to Queen Africa. You can reach us on um, Team Osiris International coming very soon. as Team Osiris International on Facebook. And coming very soon, Team Osiris TV. So all of these outlets are available for you to come in, man. One soul infinitely resurrected in spirit. Um, our solution is um, found in science as well with Team Osiris. So we appreciate everybody that listens. This is Kansu Sheshmu Amon, and we out.